Welcome back, Warriors. Kwe Tunse Sego Ani Buju. Kwe Ninda Luizi Pampometer, and I'm the host of this show, The Warrior Life. This show is about living the warrior life, a lifestyle that focuses on decolonizing our minds, bodies, and spirits, while at the same time revitalizing our cultures, traditions, laws, and governing practices. And it's also about asserting, living, and defending our sovereignty all over Turtle Island. And the key to our collective resistance and resurgence is all about the collective. It's about our family, our friends, our community, our nations, our relations. It's a concept of peoplehood and our responsibilities to one another. And today's guest is literally the epitome of community and taking care of one another. I, I have followed this guy's work forever, I have to say, and it is tiring just following what he's doing. So Michael Redhead Champagne, he is literally a powerhouse behind so many community-based initiatives in Winnipeg, Manitoba, and beyond. He's a community organizer. He's a public speaker. He's won lots of awards. He's literally inspiring the hearts and minds of people everywhere not just inspiration, but into action to make a difference, to help protect one another and improve the lives of people. He is literally, I think, made up of boundless energy. And I'm starting to think that probably comes from a place of love for our people. I am so honored to have you here, Michael. Welcome to the Warrior Life Podcast. Tanse, Pam, thank you so much for having me here today. I'm so excited to spend some time with you and all your awesome viewers. Yeah, no, there's so many awesome listeners and viewers all over who literally listen to this stuff to learn more for the purposes of taking action. It's all about education for action. And so before we get right into it, because I know you and I are like those high energy people and we could just, you know, <laughs> go right off to the races. I always like to offer people an opportunity to introduce themselves the way they want to talk about where they're from or things according to their protocol. Thank you. I really, that's super kind of you. I appreciate that. I guess I'll just introduce myself, Tanse, Michael Redhead Champagne, Natish Nakasin. My name is Michael Redhead Champagne. I'm pumped to be here today. <laughs> I know we're going to have a good time. It's going to be a party. It's going to be a revolution. And I know that I'm really excited to be here as a, a small piece of the puzzle to try to make our communities a little bit stronger. So the work I do in Winnipeg and Winnipeg's inner city and Manitoba and beyond is working with often now within systems. Once upon a time when I was a young person, I would do a lot of youth work. Then as I grew, I did a lot of more indigenous leadership specific work. Then I moved to doing like kind of neighborhood specific work. And now in my, my old age of 34, I'm now doing a, a lot more system uh, related work. And so I'm working in many different systems, not only uh, existing systems, but trying to build up alternative systems. I think it's critical for us, especially as Indigenous folks, to be leaning into our teachings and leaning into our languages and leaning into those message that our knowledge keepers kept safe for us through such terrible things. And so we have that responsibility to our knowledge keepers to be building new systems with our knowledge and our ceremonies and all of the beautiful facets of our identity at the center of it. Because sure, we can decolonize systems here and there, and that is an absolute necessary thing that we need everybody for. However, if we are to achieve the revolution, we just got to build something totally uh, different than what we're currently using. And the lucky thing for Canada, especially as a country, is that we have Indigenous leadership that is looking out for everybody, even if they don't like us for doing it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, whether they like it or not, we're going to protect your life. <laughs> we're going to protect the planet. That's yeah. so awesome. And what I really like about what you're saying is it is so different from the norm, that just tinkering around the edges, just trying to make little tiny changes, that kind of really tiny incremental that doesn't even keep up with human beings. And you're talking about, well, where it needs to be dismantled, dismantle, where it needs to be rebuilt, rebuilt. That's the hard work, but you don't shy away from it. You totally engage in that. And you know, there's like so many projects you're working on that I'm totally going to interrogate you about here today. But before that, the number one question I always get from listeners is they want to know a little bit about the person's life journey, whatever they're willing to share. How did you go from little tiny baby Michael 
to this powerhouse youth to what you're doing now. What was a little bit about your- For me, I'm originally from Shamatawa First Nation, but I call the North End of Winnipeg home. And so I feel privileged to be here in Winnipeg's North End, where we have such a high concentration of urban Indigenous people, as well as an extremely resilient community. So the North End of Winnipeg has always been a working class community. And right now we are experiencing an Indigenous resurgence of leadership. And it's absolutely fantastic to be a part of. And so that's something that I really appreciate because I didn't get to grow up in Shamatawa First Nation because like too many kids and families in Manitoba, I was affected by the child welfare system. And so uh, my mother was in Indian residential schools. Her children ended up in the child welfare system. And I often tell folks that I won the CFS lottery and CFS in Manitoba's child and family services. And what I mean when I say that is I ended up being adopted by this beautiful family here in the North End of Winnipeg called the Champagnes. And that's why I say I won the lottery because these beautiful people fostered over 300 kids as emergency foster placements in in their time supporting families uh, with CFS. And out of those 300 kids, they ended up adopting two children. And I was one of those. And so that's why I say I won the CFS lottery and having examples of parents like that care so deeply for children is an example that they didn't have to do that for those children. They didn't have to do that for me. And so I feel a sense of responsibility to take that powerful message that they shared and amplify that in my work today. And so they never said this to me, but I often say that the lesson that they taught me is that it's all of our responsibility to take care of all of the children all of the time. And so that's something that's absolutely critical for us to be thinking about. And I'm grateful to be from not only Shimadwa, which is a, a strong First Nation with beautiful Inanu teachings and humble, uh, great sense of humor people, um, but I also happen to have been raised here in the North End of Winnipeg, where there are such beautiful families like the Champagnes um, that take care of one another and epitomize that statement of it is all of our responsibility. I really am grateful for that. So that's where I come from. And I still live here in the North End of Winnipeg. And so how I went from being in just the littlest kid in the Champagne family to where I am today is simply by taking every available opportunity. Um, that presented itself to me, even if I had any kind of inkling or interest in it. A lot of things people think isn't, did you ask if it was for you? Did you ask if there's exemptions? Did you ask if you can bend the rules? Because if you want to do something, you should just ask if you should do something. And I learned at a young age by attending conferences that were for older kids, that it was possible. So that's really how um, I, I got into youth leadership in the beginning. And I think that just snowballed into me recognizing the, the circumstances of indigenous children, families and indigenous people as a whole, recognizing the history that Canada has with family separation and coming to the conclusion that the solution to histories of colonial family separation is a future that's built on indigenous kinship systems. So it doesn't seem like the math is not that hard to me. <laughs> yeah, no, no kidding. And the, th the whole thing about kinship is that it's like, everybody it can be from different nations it doesn't matter where you live it's a concept of family and kin which can be relationships however they're formed it can be by birth it can be by adoption it can be by just hanging out it can be by all of the things all of the ways that we are as native people there's some kid who hangs around the house and then next time he's living there for a couple of years and well i guess he's my kin now this is my new son and it's just it's a beautiful way of being, but it can literally be the theme to how we rebuild and change these problematic systems that you talk about. It has about. to be the theme. It has to be the theme. And I think the other thing that's so beautiful and what I've been feeling grateful for in my life, because that led me onto a journey of becoming a storyteller and becoming a public speaker. And so I've had not only opportunities to do lots of awesome community development, youth mentorship and community organizing in my community, that's taken me around the world to so many interesting and different places. And so every time I'm able to go to a different community, it's such a joy to seek out the indigenous knowledge and the indigenous people there. And, and I think that in, in my teachings and in my language, we have the word it's Wakotuwin, it means kinship, right? It means family. And it's not just about treating a human beings like your family as they are. It's also about recognizing that we are related to the land. We are related to the animals. We are related to, to, to the water. 
and recognizing that our relation and our kinship systems runs a lot deeper than just what maybe mainstream society would understand yeah. a family to be, I think is really important. And so I guess I have a question for your uh, viewers and your listeners to please share uh, in the comments or online. Yeah. Um, what is the teaching in your nation that you think we should build the revolution on? Because for me, in my nation, if, if it was a Cree, if it was a swampy Cree revolution, <laughs> yeah, yeah. if it was an new revolution, I would want it to be built on Wakotuin. <laughs> so awesome. You know what, what, what would you to... want? What, what do you think that would be? What, what, what kind of Mi'kmaq teaching do you think kind of you feels good for you there? Of like, what do we have to build the revolution on? And... Understanding that uh, our relations are everybody, the spirits, our ancestors, those that we don't see, all of the spirits that live inside of trees, they talk to one another, they protect one another. If we could be like all of the other living entities whose whole existence is actually based around their symbiotic relationship with one another. Like each different kind of tree finds a different way to protect each other from insects or diseases or whatever. And they don't have to do that, but that's how we all live together in this like relationship. I don't know. I think relations is the best. And the same with all of the people we don't see, our ancestors who are literally right beside us. Even if we can't see them, they're here. And to me, I just think if we all cared about all of our relationships that way, then we wouldn't have this problem where we see humans and trees and water as commodities, as exploitable, as expendable, all of those horrible things that you and I work so hard to advocate against. We'd be able to put all of our energy just into maintaining, sustaining, thriving, rebuilding, all the good stuff, instead of constantly trying to be <sighs> stopping all of it, the negative stuff, the people who don't see those topics. There's a really great book that I read called um, the new, uh, Ending the New Jim Crow Organizing Guide. All right, it's written out of America, a very short book, uh, a short read for folks. Uh, maybe we can share the link at some point. But basically what it does is it talks about uh, the four different roles that we need in a movement. All right, and so the way that uh, they identify it in that particular um, situation is, and I just can't help it, but I reframe things into an indigenous lens. And so they have four different areas and I'm like, oh, hey, I've been shared a lot of Anishinaabe teachings, a lot of Anishinaabe ceremonies and including the medicine wheel. And so what that, what that means is that when I hear four things, I wonder, I wonder if there's any kind of correlation. And so it was interesting for me learning about that because the four roles that they ended up identifying in the book, I interpreted those roles to be, first of all, the helpers. Okay. So these are the frontline folks. And um, these are the people who are like literally right there doing face-to-face -face support, one-on-one -on -one fire keepers, cooks, the people that are floating around and supporting people uh, wherever help is needed. They're the hands and feet of the movement. Okay. So these are the helpers. All right. First role. Next one is we have advocates. All right. These are the people who work with systems. I wonder, we might know one or two of those folks that work with systems, right? And so they understand how all of these systems works, how to use them, how to get people through them. If you're tangled in it, they can get you out. The system experts, they're fantastic. We need the advocates. All right. But then we also have the organizers. All right. These are the, the builders. Okay. These are like the beavers, beaver teachings. Maybe folks have beaver teachings in their culture. Don't know. <laughs> But organizers, they're building that beautiful new solution for us that will ultimately someday replace the broken systems we're currently tinkering with. And finally, we have the rebels. All right. These are the troublemakers. They speak <laughs> truth to power. They disrupt things. All right. They do often have great personal sacrifice to themselves, to their body, to their wellness. They get attention of the whole system. They call out these injustices and often they're vilified for it. And so we have all four of these different roles in our movement, in the revolution, and we need them all. We need our rebels. We need the advocates. We need the organizers and we need the helpers. And here's something that I think is, I notice in the community and in community organizing, those groups piss each other off all the time. <laughs> yes. Um, every single time. The advocates aren't radical enough for the rebels. All right. The um, helpers aren't uh, system enough for the advocates. 
the like I could just go in a circle all day long about yeah. how these different groups of people disagree with one another about how the other group is behaving. But the reality of the situation is we need all four of them to, to be doing their best at all times and actually supporting one another where possible. We can't be in all places um, at all times. We can't do all, all the time, but we can build relationships with our kin, with our, our, our movement. And hopefully with that indigenous knowledge at the base and these lessons, obviously that are coming out of the, the black struggle in America against policing and justing and over-incarceration, we can take these knowledge, these knowledges and mash them together into something that makes sense within our territory. And I just, I like to share that message because I know there's a lot of uh, disagreement. There's a lot of people that, you know, disagree with Michael, disagree with Pam, disagree with lots of folks, and they are entirely allowed to have that disagreement. And it doesn't mean we need them any less. Just because yeah. you don't like what I'm doing doesn't mean I don't need you. Yeah, exactly. It's so true. There's people who used to complain all the time. Like I've, I work with elected leaders, traditional leaders, community-based people. And sometimes I would hear, oh, here comes that community member to our meeting again. And she's just gonna complain and yell and ask questions. And I, I would always say, yeah, that might feel frustrating, but wow, doesn't she care about this community? Doesn't she care enough to get up there time and time again, even though people point at her or make fun of her and she gets up there and she asks questions that other people wish they could ask. And the way she's expressing herself, that's just a symptom of everything she's experienced. But listen to the message. We don't have to all like each other. We don't have to like the person who stole our boyfriend in high school. We don't have to like our nosy next door neighbor, but we're all in it together and we got to do it. So your message is just so powerful. Like we literally need everyone. And I think this is a perfect segue into <laughs> something that you're doing. It touched my heart. And one of uh, just one of a thousand reasons why I wanted to talk to you, because I have another podcast called the Warrior Kids Podcast, and it's for little kids, uh, not teenagers, although some listen to it, probably think I'm a weirdo, but it's for little kids to really sell, not just celebrate everything Indigenous, but to talk about what it means to be a warrior, how to take action, how to protect the planet, how to care about animals, how we're all related. And when I saw that you have a new book coming out called We Need Everyone, Oh my gosh, I was like, here he is speaking to my heart again. Can you tell me about this book, please? Yes, We Need Everyone, it's, here it is, available from High Water Press here in uh, Treaty One Territory, written by myself and illustrated by Tiff Bartell. We Need Everyone is an instruction manual and a celebration. It's an instruction manual because it shares in this book different uh, steps we can take to identify what our gifts are. And it's a celebration because we list in here a number of different gifts that uh, we've, that I've seen actually in and around my community that I think are valuable and life-saving. And my hope is that every time uh, folks are reading this, they're able to either see themselves in the book, see their gift in the book, or see the, the gifts or the people that they love and care about in the book. And so why this is so exciting for me is Tiff Bartell's illustrations are absolutely fantastic. So I'll just hold it here still for a second so folks can see. As you can see, she really wants to make sure that it's a diverse uh, group. So it's all sorts of shapes, sizes, colors, and also highlight, shout out to my cat. <laughs> that's, that's my cat, Sushi. Oh my gosh, are you serious? That's my actual cat. So we'll see if at some point in the podcast, my cat Sushi actually comes out. But yeah, anyway, this it's a it's an instruction manual and a celebration for kids two to six years old um, to be able to identify what their gift is. And then hopefully talking about how we can share our gift with the community. And then also why I think that's so important is because we've done some mental health work together relating to, to kids and young people in this country. And a sad statistic that many folks don't still don't know is that indigenous young people in this country will contemplate suicide at an average age of 10. 10. I want our listeners to think about that. Think, and it's, I don't mean to get so heavy trigger warning, obviously. Yeah. Um, but think about a 10 year old you 
Think about a 10 year old in your life. Do you want them to think that the best solution to their problems is removing themselves from the equation? No, none of us want that. And so many of us have been there. So many of us feel that. And that's why this book is aiming at kids two to six and all the people that love kids two to six, because we have to stop this, uh, this problem yeah. of hopelessness in our communities before it becomes a problem. And we have an opportunity as indigenous people. We have such a young population. We have such a young population to have such a high suicide rate amongst that young population. It's heartbreaking. And I'm thinking about especially rural, remote, isolated communities mm -hmm. that I haven't been able to get to. And it costs so many hundreds of thousands of dollars um, just to go and be there with folks. This book can go to places that I can't go to. And yeah. so that's why I'm really hoping that not only will I be able to get the message out there through the I'm hidden up every single possible money bags that I know. And for this February, I love to read month. I'm running a buy a book, give a book campaign <gasps> where folks are going to be able to check out the link tree for We Need Everyone. I'll give it to you or maybe gave it to you already. There's a link tree for We Need Everyone. I'm going to be adding it in there where there'll be an address where you can purchase a book and send it to the address. It's a warehouse right here in Winnipeg. And I want that warehouse filled with <gasps> books that yes. I give away to children in care. Children in the inner city that can't afford yes. it. Folks in I children in isolated, rural, northern, and remote communities. I yes. we, need, we need everyone for real. We yes. need people that have resources to share those resources with the people who don't. And but think about it. Not only is this book by and about our people, it's your voice. And I love that it's your picture on the front. It's like, <laughs> oh, that's clearly him. Okay, that hair, that's clearly him. But the cat I didn't know is your cat Sushi. But so you've got that, you've got voice, you've got representation, you see all of our solidarity people there. But a book in and of itself is wiring your brain to be smarter, to learn. And so it's constantly getting reinforced. Like a book is so important. I just, and I love that your target age is so small because there's so little for little people. There's lots for adults. We, and we complain that there actually isn't enough for adults. And I agree, we're nowhere near where we should be on Indigenous education. But there's some stuff for teens and, but the little people, the ones whose synapters are still connecting and forging and they're still finding their way in the world and, and the things that become, that they see and are familiar with is what sticks with them and what gives them comfort. Imagine if the people they're seeing and hearing about are people, like how mutually reinforcing that is. I'm just, I'm so excited because it's all the little people who need to hear this message too. There's just, a secret teaching in the book. What? What? There's a secret teaching that oh. only the people that know are going to know. And so now you and our little listeners here, <laughs> y'all are in the know. So let me tell you the, the secret. Behind me, this beautiful star blanket. Yes. Now, something that many folks uh, may or may not know is that the star blanket originates in Cree culture. Other folks have versions of it, but from what I understand, this is something from the Inanu people. It used to be a seven-pointed star, now an eight-pointed star. There's a lot of math there. Can't get into it. <laughs> Moral yeah. of the story is we are star people. We have knowledge keepers out there like Wilfred that share beautiful teachings about how... Oh my goodness. I have it right in front of me. Here's nice. a resource uh, that was developed by <laughs> Wilfred Buck that talks about uh, the stars and how uh, there's messages and different teachings in different seasons from oral teachings from our people, from our indigenous knowledge. And so uh, we are star people. It's something I hear often from knowledge keepers. And when you look at the book, everyone has a gift, but that gift is actually represented by... Oh, a star! star. You can't really see it, but it's, it's everyone's gift in the book is represented by a star. Wow. And uh, I'm wow. so excited about that because it doesn't mention any of this in the book. Like I wanted to deliberately make this as broad as possible. I didn't want to be going into teachings necessarily. Yeah. However, for myself and I know Tiff, even Tiff is, I believe a non-Indigenous uh, artist herself, but she is absolutely understands. Um, she understood the assignment. All right. Um, <laughs> she got the assignment. And, and, and so it is absolutely so exciting to be able to have that 
uh, represented in, in the book that there's a star. The star is the gift and that's because oh. we are star people. Gosh, okay. We are going to have a warrior kids podcast conversation <laughs> at some point in the future because little people will just love this. Okay. Do you know what I can't wait for? What? I can't wait to see pictures from fa different families in different places saying, oh my goodness, my kid is in this book. Look at Yes. You know what yes. I mean? I bet you, you I bet you those four kids exist out there. <laughs> I bet you they're real. I bet you there are four kids out there that are like, I'm on a book cover. I, know. I can't wait to see them. I can't wait to meet them. You know what makes me think that half of the reason why you're excited is because you've probably never seen a book with a kid with you in the middle with all your hair and all your beautiful <laughs> wonderfulness. I bet you never saw a book like that before. I did I have not. And that's why it's so exciting. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that's my favorite part, which kind of leads me also to education because we've talked about some exciting stuff. We've also yep. talked about some of the heavy stuff, suicides. When you think about if the average age is 10, that means there have been younger and that it's like not even conceivable that could be the place. And we all know that this comes from our experiences where we have multiple overlapping traumas, experiences, not just in generations, but multiple things can happen to people. And I understand you are doing some important work around trauma informed approaches. And I'm wondering if you can just talk a little bit about that because a lot of people throw that word around, but don't really understand what it means in a specific context. So trauma informed care, trauma informed approaches, it's the new thing, okay? Mm -hmm. Everybody is talking about it, but I think a lot of folks when they're talking about it don't necessarily understand it on the level that I wish that they did. So when I, from how I get it, I understand trauma-informed care to be behaving um, in our lives, in our relationships, in our community, in our workplace, in such a way that we understand that the folks that we're interacting with may be experiencing trauma. And so when folks react to us in a particular way, maybe we don't like it. We interpret that from the lens that everyone that has experienced trauma is potentially triggerable. However, those people are still out there in the world every single day trying to do the best that they can, up to and including interacting with you. So if um, this is going on, what we need to do is we need to make sure that we are understanding that when for example, I'm uh, talking with somebody and I bring up a particular topic that I think is funny and I make an off offhanded joke, all right? Maybe I make a joke and I say a word or it's about a topic that actually is quite personal to that person's trauma. And now all of a sudden, the great talk we were having st stops. And I can tell like there's a, something that's happened in our relationship. And maybe the conversation ends awkwardly and then we go our separate ways, all right? I maybe could walk away from that and say, oh, that person's such a jerk. And from that moment forward, treat them as such. Or I could say, what happened? I could ask the question, what happened? And then I also think lean on the relationships that you've had with people in the past, right? If you've only had great conversations up until that point, what was the thing that was different? And it probably wouldn't be that difficult in that moment for me when I'm analyzing it to be like, well, the only thing that I think was different was me making that offhanded remark that I thought was hilarious. They didn't think it was hilarious. And actually it was a trigger for their trauma. So those are the moments where a trauma informed approach can help me recognize not only what's happened, but it can help me inform the way that I engage with that person in the future. It can help me with my communication and hopefully the other thing it can help. And this is why I've always pushed in the system side of things. Hopefully it can push that teaching and that knowledge into different echelons of the system so that others are able to learn the lesson without having to experience the pain. Exactly. Because we all make mistakes, even within our own families, our own friends, people we've known for a long time, all of those things. And it's just to be aware of that. I think that's what's super important. Oh, wait a second. Is that sushi? Sushi alert. <laughs> so, it's sushi. Sushi is now a superstar. Yes. He's the most famous cat in the North End. Oh, sushi but looks very velvety. 
Yeah, but he's he's running around. He's got the zoomies right now. You know how cats yeah. do the thing? Yeah. So he's he's on several missions, so I just interrupted him. He's not happy with me right now. <laughs> so I'll let him go. But yeah, I just yeah. we just had to take advantage of the moment. I'm like, oh he's he's here. Yeah, yeah. So everyone can see. Oh, that's so cute. I love oh. how that part of the pandemic is that everyone has to show their pets. That's a beautiful, that's a beautiful yes. part of the pandemic. Yes. My, my pets are not here right now, my puppies. If uh, they come, if they come, we would Yeah, love yeah, to. yeah. If they come. Okay. So back to the trauma. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Form. Like, you, you're not just thinking about this and theorizing this just on your own. You're actually working with yes. systems to help make people aware in, in, in terms of all of their relations, right? Yeah, I'm really honored and it's still in development, but I will be able to tell the bare bones of what I understand so far. Mm -hmm. The province of Manitoba is looking to increase the amount of compassionate education that they provide to administrators and school leaders in the province, which is fantastic. And I think all of us can agree that more compassionate leadership in education is an absolute must. Yeah. Now in Manitoba, we have had a heck of a time in the last couple of years from an education perspective, even prior to the pandemic with the current government and threatening to amalgamate all the school boards and all sorts of labor stuff. And University of Manitoba just had a, a strike. And anyway, moral of the story is we got some education problems here in Manitoba, but we also have some education innovation, I think probably because of the, the magnitude of the challenges we're facing. And what is going on is I get to work with a really beautiful educator in our community, a non-Indigenous educator. Her name is Sherry Block. She's fantastic. And she has a lot of really great training. In, and so what I get to bring to the table is the Indigenous knowledge, the Indigenous lens. And my experiences with community organizing, doing stuff in the inner city, doing stuff in schools and at the system level. And so what we've done is we've taken a Indigenous lens. To it. And so we're going to be sitting in Anishinaabe ceremony to be able to guide the project in spirit. We're also going to be, we've also given the program a name in Swampy Cree. So the name is Mino Wichitawin, which means working in good relations. And so the thing we're going to be doing in the future now is inviting uh, a select group of admi administrators in Manitoba, the Cool Kids Club of Principals, <laughs> to come down um, and participate um, in this. And the idea here is uh, we'll increase their skills and we don't want to add another thing to principals. Mm -hmm. We know principals, they are busy. All right. They got lots of stuff to do and we <laughs> have intense empathy for them, which is why we want to support them. So by providing this, hopefully they'll be able to not only have that compassion and indigenous knowledge led solution to compassionate strategies to doing administration and leadership within their school. We also want to make sure that there's a trauma informed lens to all of that. So all the stuff I was talking about before with trauma informed care fits in with those indigenous language teachings, with those indigenous ceremonial teachings, with those uh, place-based teachings. And so we're going to be working on making sure that mindfulness practice, and even for myself, like I'm learning as I go in this process as well, I'm not uh, as well versed in mindfulness and those types of things as my partner. And she's teaching me as we go along about things like mindfulness practices, and it's quite helpful. And I'm really feeling like I'm growing as a result of the process. And I feel like if it's a uh, growth oriented process for the helpers, hopefully it's a growth oriented process for the principals that participate in it as well. That, so that's like hopeful work. That's good work. That's making change, like change right at the grassroots level kind of work. Like all of the work's important, policy, law, you name it. But it's when you can really get down on the person to person level and not cause someone pain that, wow, because you don't know then what that triggers for the rest of the day or where that person is. So I, I just think that that is so valuable and that you take it from this approach where you're accepting that there's people at all different stages. Some are- Even me. Yeah, yeah, we all are, right? You have to take us where we are and, and go with that. And I learned so much. Like me, I, I don't know a lot about the mindfulness stuff. I don't know a lot. So I learn from people who are really skilled and centered in those kinds of works. And I think that's when you talk about all of us working together, 
then we're going to learn stuff from people who have skills that we don't or things that we want to learn. And you don't shy away from the hard stuff because trauma-informed approaches necessitates that you be aware of all of the trauma that's ongoing, not just in the past. And it's the same with your child welfare work. Like you don't seem to shy away from the hardest, most traumatic areas for our people, for anybody, in fact. And you're also doing work in the child welfare area too, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. I'm doing a lot of work in and around supporting children and families involved in child welfare. Right now, I'm the chairperson of an organization I co-founded called Fearless R2W Inc. here in the North End of Winnipeg. And the idea is that we are a child welfare education and advocacy organization. So we support parents that are working towards reunification and we support youth that are aging out of care. Now, why that is so fantastic is because Fearless was a grassroots group for the number of years prior to that. And during that grassroots period, I was able to be invited in 2018 to participate in the government of Manitoba's child welfare legislative review to be able to bring that community perspective to the Manitoba government's uh, legislative reform. Now, of course, we have not seen most of those recommendations implemented, unfortunately. And at every available opportunity that I have, I definitely emphasize and push in provincial spaces to say, yo, when are we going to get an update on the Child Welfare Legislative Reform Committee? What was the point of us doing that in the first place? That's something that as well, that, that could grassroots work connects to the local nonprofit work, connects to the provincial. Why? Here's the thing that they say all the time. We can't make decisions yet because there's federal child welfare legislation that's forthcoming. So now we can't do anything because, and so it's a really frustrating time actually right now in, um, in child welfare in Manitoba, which is why I'm always grateful to work in the grassroots with indigenous leadership to be able to identify and push for solutions from our strength-based perspective. And I also think that as we do this work, thinking about that teaching of Okotuin and we're all related and, and, and we have to teach, treat folks as our relations, we have to find joy in the heavy places. Mm. So you may notice that I am unusually upbeat discussing <laughs> topics that are unusually heavy. And I think that's because we have to shine the brightest light in the darkest places. And wow. the revolution has to be joyful. The, the revolution has to be joyful. I don't wanna be, a, if there's no room for joy, in the revolution. I don't want to be in a world where all we're doing is being angry, canceling each other, calling out the harms, saying this is bad, that's bad, you're bad, I'm bad. Um, I know. No, but think about I it. Know that. I want the joy, all right? Yeah. We're burning this shit down so we can be happy later. The revolution. We're all running towards something. Aren't we running towards the light, the better, the happy, the love, the... Yes. At the same time, honoring, acknowledging, combating, advocating, yeah. dealing with all the hard stuff. But we have to be running towards something. And, and that's why we need everyone because we need yes. both of those approaches. Yes. And we, yes. and it's hard to carry both at the same time, but we can pass the ball with each other. Everyone can yes, you know, we like, can take turns. Just like we were talking about these issues up and down. It is an up and down thing. And even kids, people underestimate the ability of kids to understand that. And we have to get at them at these little tiny ages for them to understand there's some difficult things happening. Here's how to see it, be aware of it, how to address it, how to prevent it. Because if we don't talk to our little ones about that, they don't have any of those coping mechanisms or armor to be able to combat it or help somebody else combat it. So it's just over and over again, this, your whole we need everyone concept just really fits in and that we're getting at the little kids and well, have you, heard, have you heard the goose teachings? You know, goose, goose teachings. teachings. Oh, the I, I want to say it's Anishinaabe teachings, but it might be Dakota's. I'm sure your listeners will correct me. My apologies. <laughs> I didn't mean to start a nation war. The geese teachings. You know how there's geese? They fly in a V when they got to go south or north or wherever they're going as a team. They fly in a V. Well, guess what happens? You don't get to all stay in the same spot the whole time because when you're the leader, you have to take on the most, uh, what's that word? aerodynamic yeah yeah push the wind <laughs> yeah, okay yeah. so you take on the most wind right when you're in that front thing and why yeah. you do that is because you're breaking a path it's never intended yeah. to be comfortable yeah to be the person at the top of the v okay 
But here's the other thing that I don't think we realize. Western systems don't get it, but indigenous systems do. The person at the V was never intended to be the same person. No. It was never intended that one person for the whole trip from Winnipeg to all the way to the <laughs> south, the same goose is going to take on all of the friction for the whole team. Because oh, yeah. so what happens is that goose does the best they can with the energy that they have for as long as they can for the betterment of the team. And when they can't anymore, there is no shame. They move to the back of the line because that's the easiest spot where all the other geese are yes. giving you their little wind yeah. barriers and you can fly in their little pathway. Slipstream. Yeah, Slip we're stream. not scientists here. I, I bet you there's a science teacher or someone listening right now that's like know they're screaming, like, oh. at the, screaming at the, screaming at the, ah! So anyway, uh, the moral of the story is we all have to be ready to step into yeah. the leadership role. And why that's so important is because it gives us compassion and empathy for other leaders. It also gives us the experience of leading it also allows us to experience that pain because everyone thinks that leadership is about like glory and so fancy, but it, it's a lot of pain, like when you're a leader and it's, I feel like the heavy work that I do in child welfare and suicide prevention and, and, and like systems, um, the thing that makes it okay, <laughs> the thing that makes it possible is that when I go to those places, I never feel like I'm going by myself. One, because usually I'm not, because we bring our community with us yeah. everywhere we go. Yeah. But two, should I happen to be the only indigenous leader in the room at the time, I never feel alone because I feel like our ancestors are with us. Yeah. And I feel like I got Kukums and all those that went through mm -hmm. so much stuff standing right behind me. And I just think I could back down in this moment, but what will Kukums say? How would, what would Kukum say if I had to go back to her and then say, Hey, I got to meet with this system leader, decision maker person, and uh, they were totally bullshitting me. And I just said, okay, what is Kukum going to say to you? Oh, you know? Probably not even repeatable. Exactly. And so to prevent that from happening, I imagine that Kukum is always with me and I have to behave in such a way that I can hold my head up when I'm having tea with her later. That's a good way of looking at it. That's like, that's a really good way of looking at it because Kukums would never tell you not to be assertive, not to be forceful, not to force your way into a space that you're not allowed, but they would also say you do it with respect and protocol and that to not even make an attempt, you might be denied, you might yep. be ignored, yep. they might put you somewhere else, but to not have an, even tried for your people, yep. that is the, that's the sad part. And that's, that's the thing. That, to me, that's the unforgivable part when you don't yeah. even try. You yeah. have to try. When you can. And so what I really like about you and all the work that you've done, you accept people where they are. So some people are on the boots land defenders right now because that's where there's strength and power and places but not everybody is there right now not everybody can do that not everybody can even speak up right now because they might not be in a safe place and that part of being a warrior and in the revolution is making sure you're here tomorrow and the next yeah. day in a healthy strong way and so just being strong and protecting yourself is in fact just as valuable, if not more, than what some of the other people are doing. And it manifests in so many different ways, but we only see it represented in the media in yeah. certain ways. It's just the speakers, just the advocates, just the land defenders. And I don't mean that disrespectfully because they are all very powerful people. But the woman who sits at home and says, I need to take care of my mental health today. I need to do ceremony so that I'm good to raise these kids. That's epic. The, the mom, the single mom or the single dad that is fighting to get their kids back from CFS. That's the revolution. Yes. That's yes. The re those are the leaders. Yeah, exactly. Our, our, our relatives that are out there struggling, let's minus 40 um, without having a roof over their head. All right. How, first of all, how is that happening in Canada? Yeah. Okay. Second of all, how is it indigenous people so overrepresented, especially here in Winnipeg? Absolutely not. Nobody mm -hmm. should be homeless on their homeland. No, it doesn't even make sense. It doesn't even make logical sense. It doesn't even, we don't even have like concepts for that in our yeah. traditions or languages. Not that I'm speaking for yours, but I haven't like, it just, none of that. It's like a puzzle that was never 
meant for us. It had to be set askew. And I'm thinking, okay, so Michael, I, I have a question for you and I am sure it's one of those tired old questions that people ask you a million times and maybe it's an annoying question, but you are epically boundless in an energy and joy and love, but also like action. You're always taking action. You're always taking opportunities. You're always being involved. What are the, some of the things that you do to take care of you? And the reason why I ask that is because as well as I do, there's going to be listeners or viewers who are thinking, I I'm too tired right now. I can't take on anything else. And they might not know what, what it is that we also have to have these practices where we take care of ourselves. So what do you do? So COVID-19 and this pandemic and having to be isolated at home for me as an extrovert was initially so painful, <laughs> but I only say initially because what being at home forced me to do was it forced me to be with myself. And being forced to be with myself meant I had to learn about how does Michael hang out with Michael? What is Michael's relationship with Michael? And um, what I ended up having to do was I had to develop uh, self-care strategies. Some of them I already had, uh, but some of them I just had to formalize a little bit more in terms of my self-care strategies. I'll just share with you because I always make physical uh, representations of things. So for my self-care strategies, I'm going to bring you on a journey all the way, three steps away from where we were one second ago. <laughs> All right. So can you see me? Yes, you can. All right. So I can. So what we see here is a number of activities, physical things that represent self-care activities. Oh. This is the creating of a mini zine, encouraging <laughs> story writing. You can just make it out of a piece of paper. It's very easy. The next one here is a, a me map. It's where you make a web of uh, the four most important things in your life and how you're going to accomplish them. Huh. This next one is called the uh, circle of control. It's when I feel out of control, how I bring, a, I create a today list that helps me feel like I'm back at, in control, at least for today. Music is medicine. So playlists, creating uh, playlists of music and listening to music is something that's really important for me. This is an art activity that my niece taught me about taking toilet paper rolls and uh, turning them into octopuses. Aww. Um, that's just a fun one, arts and crafts. Aww. This is something called a self-care monster. I take Kleenex <laughs> boxes and then I turn into a monster with the arts and crafts activities. And then I write my actions that I do in a day in on a sticky note. And when I complete the action, I crumple it up and I feed it to the monster. <laughs> and then when my self-care monster is full, I have to do one big self-care task for myself. Something really nice. Have a bubble bath, put my feet up. Something real self-care-ish. This one here is, uh, you trace your feet out on a construction paper. And one of them, you put your past. It helps you tell your story. And one of them, you put your future. This next one here is a self-care medicine wheel. Looking at mind, heart, body, and spirit and talking about self-care strategies. This next one is just, again, arts and crafts. I just made a sunshine with sun. This represents journaling. I uh, do a lot of journaling. And it's just a template for people to do journaling. And then the last one is uh, prayer. And of course, in Cree, it's, uh, I don't know how to say it exactly beautiful yet, but Ayameya uh, Win. Wow. So anyway, I, I was able to develop uh, uh, little, little activities <laughs> that are represented by those little thingies. Wow. So even in your self care, it's a massive wall of everything imaginable. I was expecting you to say, oh, I go and eat some donuts or I go read a book. You're like, oh, wait, let me show you this 20 point plan I have for self-care. Who has a 20 point plan for self-care? That is inspiring. That's well, if you want to have a 50 point plan for the world, <laughs> you need a 20 point plan for self-care because oh. I am no good to the world. If I don't take care of myself. Wow. And I got to show up in a good way. And so I really have to be deliberate 
about taking care of myself. And that is a question that I get all the time. Michael, how you got so much energy when you do all the depressing stuff? And the reason is by taking good care of myself, yeah, it tells yeah. me that I'm valuable. And, I'm, and that experience is something that I want everybody to have. Yeah. I want everyone to know that they are valuable and worthy and deserving of fun, joy, good things, safety, health. And so if I get it, wow, everyone should get it. And so now yeah. that I have a deeper understanding for myself of what that could possibly look like, it really helps me try to advocate um, and communicate with other people. Yeah. Cause I have now this menu of self-care activities that when I'm talking to my loved ones and they say they're not feeling well, it can be like, oh. give me the circle of control. <laughs> You Get need point number 17. <laughs> Get a piece of paper. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and, and, and why it's so great is because literally one of the, one of the activities is the self-care medicine wheel, right? So it's four different parts of uh, the mind, heart, body, spirit. And you literally just think of four activities for each of those quadrants that make you feel better. And so you plan it out ahead of time so that wow. when you're not feeling good, you literally do have a 16 point plan of steps that you can go through. And by the end of it, you've done steps to take care of all four parts of your medicine wheel. And guess what? I've never been able to make it through one full rotation of my self-care medicine wheel before feeling so good that I can go back to work or carry on with what I needed to do in the first place. Can I put this podcast on my self-care medicine wheel? Because honest to goodness, <laughs> like, if, it's just so funny that we think of the, what's the minimum thing? Okay, maybe once a month. I will do X and that'll be my self-care. You're like, oh, wait, I've got like multiple, multiple things for self-care. And imagine if in addition to the big revolution, there was just a revolution of individual hearts, minds, and spirits who are like, you know what? I deserve a 20-point self-care plan like Michael. Not Never mind this once a month, I'll go visit a friend kind of thing. Wow. I have okay. to do, I do lots of self-care things every day. I have to start my day with self-care because wow. sometimes when we wake up in the morning and it's still a pandemic, guess what? Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you stole my word. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, you are the bomb. Okay. You were the bomb when I met you. You've been the bomb all these years. My gosh, talking to you. And I know we've been on different panels a couple times together. And I'm just like, this guy is self-care. Listening to this guy is self-care. Honestly, I don't know how to thank you enough for all you do for the world, for our people, for the planet. Everything that, you know, I have learned from you, I value uh, Walalan in my Mi'kmaq language, Ikose in Cree. Thank you for all you do. All I can do is my part to sh help share your voice, share these links. I'm going to buy a whole bunch of these books. I'm going to talk about it on my little kids podcast. I'm going to make sure that everyone I know and talk to buys these books and fills that warehouse so that every one of all of these kids will have their own copy of that book that they can read over and over and over again and see themselves. Because honestly, it's just not little kids that need everyone. Us big adults need everyone too if we're going to get this revolution done. And I think with people like you in the revolution, we got this. Like, I'm not even worried. The book is secretly for adults. Don't tell the kids. Oh, yeah. Okay. We won't let them know as they're reading <laughs> for their kids. Michael, I'm, I'm in your debt. If you ever need anything, in all honesty, you just let me know. And to all of the listeners and viewers and people who are listening to this for the first time or the hundredth time like I'll do. Thanks for making the time to listen. But remember, you hear Indigenous voices. What are you going to do to lift Indigenous voices? And then what steps can you take towards that revolution? Is it buying that book? Is it making a financial donation to a land defender? Is it doing your job in your area with your sphere of influence to make things better? There's something for everybody. And that's what this podcast is about. Thank you, Michael. Thank you to all the listeners. And till next time, keep living a warrior life. Well, yes. <laughs>